Life is a journey, but what happens when we die? Is it the end, or is it just the beginning? As an atheist, Howard Storm was convinced that death marked the end of consciousness. But then he died and went to hell. Eternal life with God the Father, Jesus and Mary, the angels, the saints, and our loved ones. It is the heavenly existence most God-fearing people hope to experience, and which some have even claimed to have seen. Eternal damnation in the fiery pit of hell is a concept no one likes to consider. Yet it is a poignantly real nightmare for countless lost souls, those who die in a state of mortal sin, and self-absorbed individuals whose lives here on earth had one common denominator, the complete rejection of God and the denial of his existence. While on earth, they tossed God into the swirling sea of reasoning, a cesspool of ideologies and philosophies that claim man is master of his own fate, that powerful careers and making lots of money are the true measures of success, the formulas for happiness and fulfillment, and that in the end, all that is left, all that really matters, is our portfolio of personal accomplishments, the monuments to our ego. But after death, those human monuments come crashing down. Without God, there is only darkness and the frightening realization that hell truly exists. In the words of Protestant minister Howard Storm, it is the sewer of the universe, a foreboding place where lost souls feed off the pain of others. Storm knows this firsthand. In 1985, this self-proclaimed atheist died and to his horror found that he had been banished to hell. Howard, thanks for being with us. We really appreciate this. Thanks for having me. I'd like to begin with just the issue of, of who you were in 1985, because by all measurements, you were, you were an, an average art professor, probably very good artist. Thank you. <laughs> I've seen your work, so yeah. I know that you're, you're a good artist, yeah. but you were just the average person out there. You had not, as far as we know, committed any heinous crimes right. of any sort. Right. And yet, when you die, you're sent to hell. And that could have been anybody out there who was leading a good life. Wh why? What were you? Who were you? Well, unfortunately, for, uh, I said that from my perspective now, we are all sold a bill of goods in this society that like, being good is good enough. Um, and what we mean by being good is if you don't um, kick the dog and, you know, aren't too nasty to your wife and kids and uh, pay your taxes and don't break the laws in any conspicuous way, that's good. And um, being self-centered and manipulative and me first always kind of attitude is encouraged in our society. So I look upon myself then as living the American dream. And I think many people would say I was... Um, know on the right track but that's not why we're in this world and not why we were created and not what is expected of us to do with our lives mm -hmm. and that's what I learned you were self-centered but you were also so self-centered that you didn't think there was any other force out there that would determine your future like God you did not believe in God no sometime when I went to college I was 17 years old I just gave up on the whole God thing and, and you why? know my philosophy professor ridiculed it all as uh, like Sleeping Beauty and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and stuff like that. And these are, th basically the idea was religion was um, the opiate of the masses. It was like for adult brain people that couldn't deal with the harsh reality of existence. And um, I thought I was way beyond religion into an uh, existential, um, very materialistic, you know, very hedonistic kind of life, which I think from my perception, is the prevailing culture of our society. And you were building your own human legacy, which you thought would help live, see your name live on forever and ever, long after you were gone to nowhere. Right. What were you doing? You were, you were creating works of art? Well, I, you were I was doing painting and sculpture, and I was having 
um, my own small success. I was named Sculptor of the Year in the state of Kentucky. That was a biggie for me and stuff mm -hmm. like that. You know, sell some work once in a while, win a prize, and um, you know, that was always that next level you were trying to get to. You know, as soon as you made one level of success, it was like you set your eyes on the next one, always striving, always working to to prove basically that you were of worth, that you were of value to the world. Mm -hmm. And, but you had some struggles during those times, obviously. Who did you turn to? What did you turn to? You, I know you had some sort of um, religion instilled in you when you were younger. You didn't turn back to that at all? You never felt like you should? There was never that gnawing feeling? No, because um, as an academic, we all ridiculed those things. So mm -hmm. um, when I, I'm not proud of this, but who, who I turned to was alcohol, uh, you know, um, going out, um, staying out all night with my friends and going to hip artsy bars in Cincinnati and being really cool and listening to jazz music and getting um, in intoxicated to the point where you worried about whether you could make it home or not. I mean, that, that was my religion. Um, and it, it's also an anesthetic because inside of me there was a great emptiness, a great darkness that I couldn't fill with anything. And you felt that. You yeah. felt that void. And, and unfortunately there were times when um, I really thought about killing myself because it was like, is the pain of being alive. And I'm not talking about uh, an acute pain. This is like a, the pain is more like a numbness. Uh, uh, it's hard to explain. The angst mm -hmm. of being alive, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. You know, wouldn't it be better just to drive the car into a, you know, bridge abutment and put an end to it? And so in 1985, what, how old were you? About 30, 38. 38 years old. You're in Paris with your wife. On, a, on an art convention of sorts. Right, art tour with a bunch of students. Right. I had a, uh, at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning, I had a whole break in my small stomach, which is the duodenum. And it may, I may have had a um, ulcerous condition that I was unaware of, or it might have been from a foreign object, like a small shard of glass or something. I don't know, but I was um, taken to the big city emergency room. Well, wait, wait a minute, you collapsed on the floor though in this, oh, you're yeah, writhing it, in pain, you're yeah. writhing in pain. It, um, without any exaggeration, it was like being on fire inside. Like rats were eating you up inside. Yeah, it was it an was acid a, release that were, it was yeah, literally the, eating uh, your inside? The things that dissolve your food, the hydrochloric acid and the uh -huh. enzymes and things, were leaking into my abdominal cavity, literally digesting myself on the inside. So it's kind of eating myself up. Huh. And it was uh, the most acute pain I'd ever experienced. And they called an ambulance, yeah. and a doctor comes with, diagnoses. Oh, yeah, condition. they knew exactly what was wrong. Sent me off on um, this wild ambulance ride through Paris. With a shot on morphine, only yeah. one shot. Yeah. Okay. And as he explained, it was only enough to get me to the hospital because he said, you're going to have surgery as soon as you get there, and I can't give you any more because it will interfere with the anesthetic that they're going to administer when you have the surgery. And uh, our understanding then and in emergency was this is an extremely grave situation, like having a burst appendix, but if you get right on it and do surgery, uh, f four weeks, six weeks later, you're pretty good shape, eight to 12 weeks later, and you're good as new, no problem. If you let it go, it's fatal, you know, uh, because of the uh, uh, damage that it does to your insides, which is um, the infection of peritonitis and the digestive juices messing up your organs. So I was sent from the emergency hospital over to a surgical hospital. Um, several blocks away. And unbeknownst to my wife and I, there was no surgeon available at the surgical hospital to do the surgery. So they parked me in a room and left me there for 10 hours. And the doctors in the United States told me that my life expectancy from the beginning of this incident was about five hours. So I was in really bad shape. Um, yeah, they the kept pain. coming in and telling you that it would be soon, it would be soon, and yeah. then eventually they said the only doctor there had gone home. Yeah. And they couldn't give you any any more morphine or any pain reliever because a doctor had I was never had, given any further medication because only the doctor could prescribe medicine. I was never seen by a doctor from the time I went into that surgical hospital. So, so they come in, they say, look, the doctor's gone home. You can't have the surgery today. Right. This and is about 8.30 at night now. And he, they leave. The person leaves. And, yeah, and I um, turn to my wife who, my wife tells me this was the worst day of her life too because here she is watching her husband. Um, she's just losing her husband. My wife was an attorney then. Yeah. And she didn't know a woman of some capability and power and influence in the world. And to watch your husband just gradually die in front of your eyes and nobody cares, 
I said to my wife, it's time for us to say goodbye. And she got up from the chair, which was next to the bed, and she put her arms around me and kissed me and held me. And we told each other how much we loved each other. And every, every time I go down this road, go it makes me sad. But, you know, to say goodbye, I mean, and we knew it was forever. And I knew that when you die, I mean, I knew this absolutely positively. When you die, that's it. There is nothing else. We are a, this is what I knew. You're a biochemical organism made up of 75 trillion cells or whatever. And when the organism ceases to function, the biochemical, you know, uh, functions begin to fail and you lose consciousness and then you're dead and then your body rots and that's all there is. And anything that would be left of you would be like maybe your kids or something would remember you for a generation. Or maybe if you made something like a bridge or some artwork, you'd be remembered for a little while. But that was it. I mean, I, I knew that, absolutely. And everybody I knew knew that. You know, this was, I mean, this is a certainty. So when we said goodbye, I was saying goodbye to oblivion. And uh, eventually she was crying so hard she sat back down and I um, closed my eyes and went into unconsciousness. And you, before you went into unconsciousness, you felt a bit of relief, too, that you could escape this horrible pain. And, and it, was there a feeling of s sort of calm about it as well to you? Yeah, I, wanted, I wanted to die because there was, since they said there wasn't going to be a doctor until the next day, and I had felt for many hours like I was dying. And uh, medically, I had good reason to feel that way because I, I really was dying. Um, and the pain, which had gone from a pain that I mean, I was a big, strong guy, 38 years old, and played football in high school and so forth. This pain threw me down to the ground, kicking and screaming and yelling. And from that point on, it just went worse and worse and worse and worse. I was ready to be out, you know? I, I was ready to be gone because I can't do this anymore. You know, you can do it for one hour or two hours or three hours, but it, I was at mm -hmm. the point of like close to 10 hours and I'd, I'd had it. So I, I was ready to go. And so here, um, you know, people ask me all the time, um, were you dead? Well, it's an impossible question to answer because I had no medical attention. No one ever took my temperature. Nobody ever put the uh, uh, blood pressure cuff on me or anything. So nobody, nobody was examining me. But um, the fact of the matter was, uh, it's, a, it's a ridiculous argument. I was dying um, as much as anybody can be dying in that state. Mm -hmm. So you go into unconsciousness. Yep. And then what? To my... The shock of your life. To my complete surprise, I was standing next to the bed that I had been lying in, and there's my wife, and I'm standing up, and I, I, I know the situation. I'm completely clear about my problem, and I know I have to have surgery, and that I'm sick, and I have a perforated one, and all that stuff. But I, I feel pretty good. Matter of fact, parts of me feel um, quite good, better than they've ever felt in my life, really alive. And I try to communicate with my wife, who it appeared to me was ignoring me. You now, were next to her? You were I was on the level? other side of the bed from her. Okay. And I um, thought she was pretending that she could neither hear me nor see me. Of course, in fact, she couldn't hear me or see me. And then I realized that the bed that I had been in was occupied with a thing. And as I examined the thing, which was covered up to the neck with a sheet, um, and bent over and looked at the face, which was turned away from me, turned towards my wife, um, I realized that it looked remarkably like me. Now, this was all very confusing because how did somebody get in my bed who looked like me? Because it wasn't me, because I was alive. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the thing in the bed was, uh, it was um, a non, an inanimate object. Mm -hmm. I knew that about it. Um, and so, you know, part of me was like, that's me, but how could it be me? Because this is impossible. Because here I am. Yeah. And so, uh, I, I couldn't figure this out. So I turned to my roommate, who was a 68-year-old, very kind Frenchman by the name of Monsieur Florent, and I yelled and screamed in his face to find an answer to this problem. And he looked through me without blinking or any response at all, just as if I wasn't screaming in his face. Now, I, couldn't, I didn't know why my wife would ignore me, but I couldn't figure out why Monsieur Florent would ignore me. I mean, and so I heard people outside the room calling me by name and so I went over to the doorway of the room and I said are you from the doctor I'm really sick I have to have surgery um, you know I've been waiting a long time I'm you know I'm really in bad shape 
And they said things like, we've been waiting for you a long time. It's time for you to go. Um, hurry up. We can't wait any longer. We know all about you. Let's go, things like that. So I thought that meant, yes, they were from the doctor to take me to surgery. And they spoke English, and nobody else was speaking English to Yeah, th I thought that was very weird. <laughs> because everybody else in the hospital spoke with a very thick French accent right. or no English at all. But these people were, well, and also I thought, they want me to walk to surgery? You know, but after what I'd experienced in this hospital, uh, well, okay, okay. It's, you know, it's the way they do things here. So I left the room, and when I left the room, I had a, a really bad feeling about leaving the room because the room was bright and clear and light. It was, the room was very bright. There was a lot of light in the room. And the hallway was um, hazy. It wasn't dark. It was just foggy and hazy and dim and very unclear. But I went with these people, and I had a strong sense that um, I was leaving that room forever. And we continued on a journey that um, was ridiculously long. What were they saying to you? They were at saying, just come closer, and you kept following? Or, or what were they saying to you as you were they following? They were um, very them? insistent. Hurry up, hurry up. We've got to go. You know, we've waited for you so long, you know, we've got to take you there. They, they were very um, insistent and very clear about what they want to do, and there was about a dozen of them, and they were around What they me. look like? Were they, were they close uh, to you? Men and or? women, um, very, very pale. Everything was gray. The clothing was totally plain and gray, almost could have been like hospital scrubs, only pale gray. They were um, all adults, men and women, and they were very pale. Um, and I mean, they weren't particularly scary at mm -hmm. this point. Right. And as we went along, they became crueler and more insistent. And when you say let's crueler, what let's were Let's go. They? Come on. You're slowing down. Keep going. Keep moving. And they made fun of you, too. Yeah. And uh, they started um, ridiculing me and things like that. And I started to get really scared. but. Well, where, where was I to go? What was we were in this um, endless space, moving along, and I didn't know where we were going. Or, and I'm beginning to realize that this is not going to work out good. This isn't the hospital. They aren't from a doctor. I mean, I'm beginning. To, this is all dawning on me that this is something's going very wrong here. But there's nothing for me to do. So finally, we're in real darkness now. And I said to him, "I'm not going any further," which was a bluff because I had no sense of orientation which way to go. And they said, well, you're almost there. And they started to push and pull at me. And I tried to defend myself. And although I just had the worst day of my life and had been dying, I felt very strong. I wasn't the least bit tired. But the fight was, the sensations of the fight were just like if it had happened in this world. You know, when I hit them, I felt it. Um, when they harmed me, I felt it. But they had no sensation. No matter what I did to them, it had no effect on them. And the whole time they were hitting you, and I know earlier they were, they were, they were heckling and saying, oh, he hears us. They yeah. were making fun of you because yeah. your gown didn't cover yeah. your entire body and making yeah. fun of that. And at this point, what were they saying to you? They were, they were screaming obscenities at you? Or? Yeah, and, and laughing a lot. There was a lot of laughter. And, uh, you know, and it's really hard for me to talk about this, but, the, you sure. know, it's like he really, this, you know, he really hates this as someone was gouging me in the eye or other things. And um, their purpose was entirely to uh, um, humiliate me, not to destroy me, but to humiliate me in the biting and scratching and, uh, d you know, violating me in um, all right. kinds of ways. I mean, you wrote in the book that um, when they actually came in physical contact with you, even though you had seen what appeared to be clothing on them, you didn't feel any clothing at that point. Right. And that they were, they were like humans, but they had, what, how, describe well, what they were. Nails seemed very harsh and sharp, and uh, a lot of them were biting me, and I've not been bit a lot in my life, but they yeah. seemed to have exceptionally sharp, jagged teeth as they were biting and gnawing on me. They're just ripping your, shri your, your flesh from your body, uh, ripping it apart? Well, if they'd really wanted to do that, they could have um, had done with me in a few minutes. Right. No, they, were, they wanted to torment me, and so what they, what they were doing was really simple. They were trying to inflict pain. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me that these people had no, um, what we would think of as compassion, no love, no, you know, no human sensation of their own. So what they were doing was they were feeding off my pain, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense, that that gave them um, pleasure. 
it gave them some kind of pleasure to um, get as much pain out of me as possible. And so they were trying to prolong that as much as possible. How would you describe that kind of pain? You went through excruciating pain in the hospital, obviously. Yeah. Was it ten times worse than that? or? It was, it, much, like it was much worse physically, but what was, what hurt more about it was um, them doing it to me. Um, you know, as a, as a human being and as a man, and they did a lot of unspeakable things to me, sure. which are um, just, uh, w w how could someone do this to you? That's what hurt more. Their, their utter lack of um, any interest in me other than to hurt me is what really hurt more than the physical pain. And this just went on and on and on and on and on. Um, I don't ever think about it because if I even get close to it, I get really upset. So. And there are certain things in the world that I don't like because they remind me of it. And you wrote that it actually traumatizes you when you think about yeah, and it, like I don't go, I can't go to a bar and stuff because the noise in there and stuff, it's too, um, it's not the same, but it's just, just a little bit of comparison between the kind of uh, frivolity of a bunch of drunks in a bar, you know, to what I experienced then. Um, I don't like really loud music because of it. But anyhow, so I was lying in that place, all torn up, broken up, beat up, but more importantly, emotionally destroyed. And people were kicking me, and I couldn't respond anymore. I couldn't even moan or groan or anything. I was lying in a fetal position, just sort of trying to protect myself, all ripped up. And uh, people were kicking me, and they were expressing their disappointment that I didn't have any more um, response to what they were doing. And uh, I heard, strangely, my voice, although I distinctly did not say it, pray to God. And I thought to myself, being an atheist, like, what a dumb idea. I don't believe in God. And the second time, pray to God. And I thought, I haven't prayed, you know, in my adult life. I had stopped praying when I was like 15 or something. And uh, I'm 38 now, so I had no remembrance of prayer. I thought, I wouldn't even know how to pray if I wanted to pray. And then a third time, I said, pray to God. And I was thinking, what did I say when I was a kid? I was not intending to pray. I was just sort of curious if there was a prayer somewhere in my memory and I was trying to remember things, and it all got mixed up with the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. and it just became this big, confused mess with the um, uh, 23rd Psalm and the Our Father and things like that. And it was all, all these little phrases mixed up here and there in my mind. And I um, really wanted to grasp it, s some of this stuff. I, I, I wanted to recall this. And I accidentally mur uh, muttered a couple phrases, and the people around me, could not bear to have the mention of God. And, th and they told me so in, in the most filthy, horrible language that um, they wanted me to stop, to not talk about God, and now they were going to really hurt me if I didn't stop. But because it was so repulsive to them and literally um, pushing them into the darkness, um, it encouraged me to try and... So I was just trying to think of phrases from these memories and they're screaming and yelling at me to stop, and I'm trying to remember these things, and eventually um, I'm all alone in that place. And it's hard for people to understand, but I was left alone in that darkness, in my gore and in my pain, forever and ever and ever. And it's impossible to talk about. But that was the real hell. Because you knew. And you wrote in your book that you were in the sewer of the universe. Yeah, and I knew that I was going to be there forever. You know, and it was so bad being alone in that place that it was even like, well, maybe some of them will come back. You know, not all of them, but maybe, you know, I mean, you know, anything but just to be here. And as I looked over my life, I thought about what um, a failure I had been in terms of I had not been a good husband, I had not been a good father, I had not been a good teacher. Uh, because every, the reason why I w wasn't because I was always obsessed with what's in it for me. Um, I was not the great artist that I'd hoped to be. I was just a mediocre artist, you know, at a mediocre university. Um, everything looked so bleak, and I was thinking, why, why was I ever born to end up in this place of horror and torment, and now just abject hopelessness and loneliness? I knew that I belonged there. 
there was absolutely no sense that, you know, they got the wrong guy or, I, I, you right. know, um, I'm innocent, you know. I knew that the people that had attacked me earlier had been people like me. I, I'm not proud of this, I'm really ashamed of this, but there was a spiritual affinity between them and me. They were, they were like soulmates, if you will. And that my only hope in this place was to somehow become one of them and no longer be their victim. But I didn't want to do that either because I hated them and I hated what they stood for and I hated their darkness and their cruelty and all that. And so the situation seemed to be so completely hopeless. I knew that I was never going to see my wife again. I was never going to see the world again. I didn't know where I was, but I knew that I was in the garbage heap. I was in the cesspool. And I knew that when I, you die, your consciousness and who you are keeps going. Mm -hmm. And it was going to go on forever. I, I, I knew that I could never be extinguished. And uh, What were you thinking about God at that point? I got the strangest, vivid memory in my mind of myself as a child, maybe like um, eight years old, sitting in a Sunday school classroom and we were singing Jesus Loves Me. And not only did I get the memory of myself as a child doing this, but I could also feel what I had felt as a sweet, innocent child, uh, just um, as simply as possible, that there was a goodness in the universe, un un unknowable goodness, much greater and bigger than anything that we could understand out there. And, we, and its name was Jesus. And that in this goodness really cared about me, really loved me. I mean, not gen gen generically, but specifically cared about me. This really great, wonderful, I hate to call him a man, but um, mm -hmm. this personage, Jesus who is unlike, I mean, unlike any human being in, in, in his greatness and his power and his goodness. So this inspiration and, was being given to you at this point then? Uh-huh. Okay. And it was a very d powerful memory. Well, you can imagine, as deep in despair as I was, this was like, and this would be like giving the Hope Diamond to a, a, a pauper on the street. I mean, this was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for this because mm -hmm. this is like the first ray of hope I've seen in this whole scenario. And you didn't, you didn't think in some way you were hallucinating, this was a bad dream, it was all going to end, you just knew this was real. This was far more real than any experience of reality I've ever had in my life. People can understand, this world is a dream compared to the afterlife. Now people think, well all I know is this, so the afterlife must be dreamlike. They're completely wrong. This is the dream. Your sensations are fewer in this world. Your, um, your, your uh, feelings and knowledge and abilities are much fewer in this world than they will be in the next world. Whether you're going up or down, mm -hmm. you're going to have um, a much new sense of what it means to be who you are. And I called out in that darkness, not knowing if Jesus was real, but simply hoping based on that childhood faith that um, it would, it, that he would be real. But I didn't, you know, so I said, Jesus, please save me. And with that, a um, tiny pinpoint of light appeared in that darkness and very rapidly got brighter and brighter. And then this huge, impossibly bright, white, warm light was over me. And I felt hands in this light picking me up into it. And also because I was now in light for the first time, I saw how horrible I was, and I looked like... Um, you weren't scared, though. No. Um, I was amazed and in awe, but not afraid, because it was just so beautiful and, like, wonderful. And it was a little bit scary, but it was, like, just so great, you know? Um, and he, as he touched me and picked me up, all that gore, all that horror that was me, all went away, and I was made whole physically, but more importantly, all the pain inside of me was filled with ecstasy. And the ecstasy, quite simply, was is the um, incredibly powerful sense of love that he was sharing me, that his love for me. And I knew 
several things immediately. One, that this was indeed who I'd called out to. This was Jesus. This was a person of great power. This was a person of unbelievable goodness, um, just pure, perfect goodness. Um, I, I don't know how I knew it, but I knew he was really smart and that I knew nothing compared to what he knew. I knew that he knew everything about me, um, even everything I'd ever forgotten, he knew. I knew that he knew me more intimately than I knew me. How'd uh, that you know. make you feel, though? Um, <laughs> he knew some worried. bad things, yeah. I was worried about that. But it was all um, good because he loved me so much, and I can't begin to describe. You know, I wish that there was some way that I could uh, manufacture or create some kind of um, substitute experience for people and how much God loves them, how much Jesus loves them, because um, it would totally change their lives. And they can have that experience, but I can't do it for them. Um, they have to do it for themselves. What did he look like? How can you describe him, if you well, can? Well, at this time, he was just bright white light, and all I um, could do was feel him. And he held me against him, and he embraced me, hugged me, and stroked my back like a, a mother would um, a lost child, you know, sort of um, there, there, and comfort me. And I did the um, only reasonable thing. I cried like a baby and slobbered on him. It was like really embarrassed because I was slobbering on because I was crying so hard. And uh, he was rubbing my back and holding me, and then we began to go out of that place. We just went straight up and away from there. And was he alone? Were there angels around him? At this point, um, it was just he and I, and as we moved towards more light and more points of light, I became aware that all those points of light weren't things, that they were people like him, which I like to refer to as angels or saints, whatever. And they were all moving, and way off in the distance was a great center of light, and we were moving towards that, and I all of a sudden felt terribly ashamed um, because I felt like I was such a piece of garbage, and this was so holy and good, and I thought to myself, he's made an um, awful mistake, and I don't belong here. And so we stopped at that point, and he said to me, we don't make mistakes, and you do belong here. And I was quite taken aback because... He hadn't spoken to me up until this time, and he was speaking directly into my mind. And I could hear his voice, but it wasn't coming through my ear. And I also <laughs> caught on that he was also hearing what I was thinking, which was a little more disconcerting. And then he said, after we exchanged some conversation this way, telepathically, um, he said that he had some people he wanted me to meet. And he called out with musical tones, and some of these angels came and were, we're all in space now. We're not in heaven, and we're not in hell. We're just in between, and they came, and um, they, um, we made more talk, and they said that they wanted to show me my life, and interestingly, they had a complete record of my life, these angels. They had recorded every minute of my life, including my thoughts, my feelings, including the feelings and thoughts of the people that I'd interacted with, including even things that had happened to the people that I interacted with that I wasn't aware of, like the bad day my dad had had at the office and came home and he and I had a fight. I mean, I got to see what he went through. You saw everything or just bits and uh, pieces? Episodes. Episodes. Yeah, I didn't see my entire life. Um, we just went through episodes starting in a chronological order. And you, How did you see it? Was it? You saw it in your mind? There was actually like No, a it was real strange. It was like um, watching a play on a stage and there were just actors and there, and there were hardly any sets. So if it was like my mother and I talking and my mother drinking coffee at the kitchen table, it was like the table and my mom and her, maybe a little bit of the linoleum, but right. the counters weren't there. Right. Because what they were showing me was that all that really mattered was how I had interacted with people, whether I had been a compassionate person or not. That's all they were interested in. We would get up to points in my life where I, I would, um, you know, have an accomplishment, like win a shop, an eight high school shot put meet or something, which was my big event in high school was shot put. And uh, that skip over. And I said, wait a minute, I just want, I wanted a shot put there. I worked really hard to get to that point, you know. And I said, well, that's not important. What's really important is um, this. And they'd show me like how I'd shown a little kindness to a uh, really fat, uncoordinated kid who didn't know how to throw. And I was trying to teach him how to throw the shot. And I was like, they're going like, see, that's, that's good stuff. 
You know? So they showed you the good things, and when you when you looked at good things, it made them happy. And then when you saw the bad things, they became very sad. Yeah, um, and extremely disappointed. Um, I knew, fortunately, that they loved me, no matter what I did. But I knew that I majorly was letting them down, and that they very much disapproved of what they were seeing. It was like, um, you know, we we had such greater hopes for you mm. than this. Mm. What was Jesus yeah. saying or doing at this point? Um, holding me, loving me, and sharing his feelings about what we were watching in my life and with me. And as we saw the bad things become more prevalent and the good things less prevalent as I matured, um, I felt very, very ashamed. And I didn't want, I didn't want him to see it, even though I knew, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous because he knows all this stuff. But I was like, I wanted to, I, I wanted to um, you know, hide, hide it from him. You know, don't watch this stuff, you know. Was he angry with you, or was he just disappointed? Um, not angry. Uh, very, very disappointed. Like a parent he had would be with a big, child. Yeah, because he had really big hopes for you. Because he really, I mean, I was, it's a weird thing to say, but when you're in with Jesus, it's like you're the most special person in the whole universe. That's the way he makes you feel. You know what I mean? He just makes you feel that you're just the most neatest, wonderful thing, and, and, all of his attention and the, everything in the universe has been about making you a beautiful child of God. And with, with all the hope for the potential that that could be, and um, I flunked. I flunked the very reason why I was put into this world, which is um, what one way of studying it is, as Jesus did, which is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That nice summary of what we're here to do, to love one another. And I had, I had loved me. I made myself a God. Had you loved yourself over your wife, over your children? I'm sure you loved your family. Yeah, that, to, because most people your, say, but your, look, I'm your, working hard for my family. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I'm, I love them, but I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and that's why I've got to be away from them, and that's why I've got to yeah. try to strive to become number one, yeah. because they're going to benefit. I mean, that's right. the argument a lot right. of people yeah, make. Absolutely, and I, I'm, you know, this, it hurts me to say, but yeah, I love myself a whole lot more than I love them. But it was the rationale, as you said, was, hey, you know, what's good for me is good for them, ultimately, right? You know? Right. So I neglected them and emotionally um, cheated on them. You know, we don't want to go into that too far. Mm -hmm. Well, so you saw this view, and up to what point did you, they take you? Up until your to your marriage, until the till you. Oh no! Up to the to the present. Uh huh. It was uh, quite bleak, and I was so happy when it was over, because um, having been a teacher, I realized that I had. Not only had I n not passed the course, I had flunked the course. You know, I'll, you're not Catholic, but a lot of Catholics would look at that and say, well, that's kind of like the purgatory we're taught about. Yeah. So it would be sort of like a purgatory. A yeah, place and where I heard a priest explain purgatory this way, which I think is really wonderful. He said, don't think of purgatory, this is a priest speaking, I'm quoting him, don't think of purgatory as a geographical place. Think of it as a state of being. Mm -hmm. And um, I certainly believe that uh, we need to be purged or purified before we can go to heaven. Even so, after our death, even though yeah, we've accepted oh, yeah. Jesus. Even if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Absolutely, because none of us are perfect enough, pure enough to go to heaven. I mean, Mother Teresa would be the first one to tell you that she's, you know, she needs more perfection, filled with the goodness of Christ and let go of whatever those little things that she might have been holding on to, you know, in her life. Um, so I thank God for that purgation or that purgatory or whatever. But you don't want to think of it as like um, a country that we have to sort of make the journey through. Think of it as a, a process that's a wonderful uh, grace of God that we're given, that we are made perfect by God so that we can go to heaven. And nobody is good enough to go to heaven without the, the love and the perfection of God interceding on our behalf. So what happened next? So you, after you see this, this view of your life, then what? Well, they said, do you have any questions? And I said, oh, I've got a million questions. And they said, well, ask whatever you want. And they were the most wonderful teachers because um, they were trying to speak directly to my level of understanding, which was um, pathetically low in comparison to them and um, 
I had, you know, like no theological or religious background or understanding at that point, so I sure. didn't even know what was good stuff to ask. But <laughs> so I asked all kinds of questions, yeah. historical questions, biblical questions. And um, everything I asked, they answered. They, a lot of times they showed me things. There were times when it was like we were there right. in, I would say, what would the future be like and we'd be in the future? What, what was this like and we'd be there? Um, and it was very uh, um, important experience because people asked me, how long did this last? And I said, well, I learned a whole lot more than I ever learned in graduate school, which was three years. And this was a much more intense and thorough course. So I learned way more in this question and answer period, however long it took, which I don't know, mm -hmm. than I'd learned going to the University of California, Berkeley. Well, let's go through some of those questions. Okay. I don't know if we can tackle all of them, but yeah. let's go through some of them. What are some of the most important ones that you felt like you asked? I know you ask about, let's for, say, for example, you ask about Jesus in the Bible. You said, is that all that Jesus did? You know? Right. And they said that, uh, it was funny because this is in the Bible. I didn't know it at the time, but they said that if, um, if they'd written down all the things that Jesus did, it would fill all the books in the world. The world couldn't even hold all the books about what Jesus did when he was in this world. And, you know, um, Jesus is alive today. Jesus has been around from the beginning and is still around. And the reason why Christianity exists, and the only reason why it exists, is because millions of people have experienced his love, his presence, his power, They've experienced him in some way in their lives. Mm -hmm. And there are millions and millions of people, and there have been for over 2,000 years, that know that he is real, you know, and that he is what God has sent to us so that we can have a proper relationship with God. And, and they told you that, that what's contained with, that he did much more, but what's contained within the pages of the Bible is all that we need to know yeah. to do what we're supposed to do on earth to get to heaven, to Absolutely. be with him. Um, you know, those four little Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, seem so little, but um, when you try and preach them every Sunday, there's so much there that there's more than a lifetime's worth of learning and preaching and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, in what we, we know more than enough about Jesus to know that we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yeah. You talked also about... Um, how we got here and how when God began and when it does when when he began or was he always there talk about that for us well one of the things that I thought was interesting I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're asking but that the creation didn't happen mm -hmm. once a long time ago and like you know that old idea that the clockmaker made the clock and then wound it up and it's been Something sort of like ticking ever since yeah that God has been doing the creation and is doing the creation and that we um, are invited to be a part of this. We have this, one of the terms for God is the creator. Mm -hmm. And we, it says we're made in the image and likeness of God. And we're invited to participate in the creation. And one of the, in this life, one of the ways that we do this, an obvious way is to have children and to mm -hmm. raise them. I mean, what more creative act could you possibly want? And what a more awesome responsibility than to have children and be responsible for their nurture and education and well-being. And, and you wrote that he, he, he is a part of each and every one of us and that he takes great joy in seeing each and every human being. But that seems so mind-boggling given the tremendous population on our earth that, that yeah, he's but, actually yeah. but able... But the irony is, is that for God it's so easy. You know, if, if for God, God's conscious... See, because I mean, we can only project our sense of consciousness onto God and anthropomorphize God, mm -hmm. but God's consciousness permeates everything. And um, the term, one of the terms that we use for this is the Holy Spirit, that that Spirit of God in, our, in, in the ways that God has revealed God's self to us, that Spirit is everywhere and through everything. You know, um, um, God is with the creation, and God is present to us. Mm -hmm. And we can either um, be aware of that and act accordingly, or we can be oblivious to it and deny that. If you had not been sent back to earth, where might, you, where might you have gone after you had left the angels and Jesus? What Would you have gone to heaven at that point because you had been purged, or would you have had to go to another point where you'd have to learn something else before you to reach a higher level than another higher level? I, I, I don't honestly know the answer, so I can only speculate, but I wasn't ready to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, they made it really clear to me that I was not a candidate at that point. I were wasn't you shown where other people were going? I, I think you wrote about maybe somebody by a... Um, a book reading a, a, a famous novel of some yeah, sort. Yeah, there, there are places where I could have gone and matured spiritually. 
in, in God's whole creation, but I, I have no, I can't comprehend it all. It's way too beyond my understanding. But you saw that? They gave yeah. you a vision of that? Yeah. So people God, see, the thing that people don't realize is that we constrain God and make God so small after our image. But God's love for us is without limit and so vast that God will do exactly the right thing for that individual, which he knows, God knows mm -hmm. intimately, what they need to develop in their spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And you, you wrote that heaven is nothing like the image we have of heaven here on earth. No, and I, I, I don't understand because it's really um, sad. Uh, heaven is um, the center of all the creative activity of the universe. And of course, what's in the midst of heaven would be God, which is the source of everything that is. God is the source of not just life, but light, energy, space, time. There is nothing that isn't from God. And um, so to be, to go into the um, unlimited variety of heaven and experience of heaven is the greatest joy in the whole universe. Everybody, every awake spiritual being in the universe wants to go to heaven and be with God. Um, and the only beings that don't want to do that are um, beings that are uh, tremendously uh, deceived. Mm -hmm. And so when I use the word awake, you know, anyone that wakes up realizes that he heaven is the next step. That's what you want to go to, and you want to live a life that would qualify you to be there. Because I know even in the Catholic Church, there's, it, it, it's taught that based on your spiritual level when you die, you go to a different level. Right. That some people might be at a higher level in heaven. And, you know, of course the argument is, if you're in heaven, you're happy anyway, so what does it matter? Right, and you've got all the time in the world to advance and grow. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're going to be stuck there forever. You know, you can, you'll, mo you'll move on and you'll grow. Move up. And you, yeah. you, did you physically see p um, souls or, or people speaking with, I, I know you wrote in your book, maybe they would be speaking with a saint um, who had died before them. You saw that? Yes, okay. they showed me that. Okay. So that would be so. one way to attain that higher spiritual level that you're talking about. Right. And God doesn't coerce us. God's not going to do, like, um, surgery on us mm -hmm. and make us right. God's going to let us grow into it mm -hmm. um, at eternity. our own rate. Yeah. <laughs> Which is forever. Yeah. But what about religions? I know you got to talk about religions. You ask, which is the best religion out there? And you were expecting him to answer what? Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic, you know. So I... I I expected to hear, yeah, become a um, Southern Baptist. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I expected God to say, you know, Jesus to say to me. And um, instead, what he said was, um, there are good people in bad religions, and there are bad people in good religions, and that he told me, and this was specific to me, to seek out the religion that brought me closest to God, which ultimately, when I came back to this world uh, um, after months of trying to figure out what in the world that would mean. I went back to the tradition that my parents had raised me in mm -hmm. and that I'd grown up in, and that's the religion that I all of a sudden realized, boy, this really fits like a, um, you know, glove, because it's, it, it was so much part of my uh, formation as a child. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the teaching, though? And since you're a Protestant, and I, nowhere in here do you ask him, do you have to say, in Verbally, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior in order to get to heaven. You never ask him that. No. Why not? I, I, um, at the time, I, mean, I, I didn't ask a lot of things because I wasn't, um, you know, in any way religiously or theologically sophisticated. So, and, and also, um, during almost my whole experience with Jesus, I assumed I was going to heaven. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know I was coming back here. I mean, I wasn't going to ask about right. looking back. I was looking forward. But knowing what you know now. Is that an important question? Absolutely, and I've devoted my life to convincing people that that's the critical question. Mm -hmm. um, to make Jesus your savior is to put your trust in him and to the best of your ability, um, follow his teachings, to learn about him, to communicate him with prayer um, to be his advocate and to um, stand up for what he believes and what he's given you to understand a belief, um, even but at your expense. But does that mean, because one thing that I, I, I seem to get out of your book, a theme, was that a Hindu or a Muslim that was following God's commandments, that loved God with all 
his or her heart and soul that was trying to be a good person and, and be the person God intended them to be would be able to get to heaven as well, even though they may not have said verbally, I believe in Jesus Christ. They will, because the uh, Bible says that no one comes to the Father except through the Son, and that um, everybody, everybody in the universe, and I can point this out many times in the Bible, is going to meet Jesus. Um, if they have the spirit of love in them, they will know him, and he will know them. You know, he said, I have sheep that do not belong to this fold, you know. Um, they will know him when they die, or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you you know, people have, asked, people have asked me, how can God condemn billions of people in this world to hell who have never even had an opportunity to know Jesus? Well, um, first of all, I don't believe that God does that. I don't believe that God's that capricious and cruel. And secondly, that I think that uh, Jesus is working in the world um, in ways that we aren't aware of. But as my um, systematic theology professor, Gwinye Muzarera from Zimbabwe, explained to me, um, as an African, he was thankful that the missionaries brought Christianity to Africa to give them a more perfect understanding of God and of Christ. Not that they were devoid of God or Christ before the missionaries, mm -hmm. but what the missionaries brought was this, a complete understanding. Mm -hmm. um, no longer looking for God in the rocks or trees or animals or sky, but knowing who God really is. Right. So everybody s is seeking God in their own way. But what we have been given as Christians is a complete, perfect understanding of God and an absolutely ironclad, guaranteed way to get to God. And it's not through our becoming perfect saints. It's not through our good works, but it's through our trust in the one whom God sent to bring us home. Mm -hmm. This is all about God wanting to bring his children home. Now, you found that out when you came. I'm going to ask you more questions about what you discussed, but you found that out, that to be true, um, when you came back to life and you were sitting with an old nun friend, Sister Dolores, and who obviously was a big believer in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you told her about she your experience. <laughs> yeah. you she married him. She even had a ring. <laughs> about your experience, and you were scared she wasn't going to believe you. And what were her words? When I told her my experience, she just looked at me. And I said, Sister, do you believe me? Because I didn't, and, you know, so she's giving this funny look, and she said, well, of course I believe you, but she said, I've got one question. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, I wonder why it took so long. And I'm like, what? What, what? what do you mean, why it took so long? She said, she said, I've been praying for you for 13 years, ever since the day I met you and you told me you were an atheist. I've been praying for you every day. I have other sisters at the Notre Dame convent praying for you, and I don't know why it took 13 years. It should have happened sooner. Um, uh, I'll always love that. So you think she prayed you into this then? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. If um, Sister Dolores hadn't been praying for me, I'd be, I would have died June 1st, 1985. It was through her prayers that commended me to God. Mm -hmm. You know how like um, when someone's trying to get into college, you try and get them good recommendations? Right. You know, if you can get a good recommendation from like a senator or something, you know, like, right. you know, they're going to get into the Naval Academy or into Harvard or something like that. Right. Well, um, that's when we pray for someone, it's like, sending our recommendation to God. You say, you know, okay, God, I know this person's got a lot of problems, you know, and they're making some mistakes, but, you know, like, have mercy on them, right. be good to them, you know. And the irony was when she first came to the university and you had a talk with her, you said, look, sister, you can teach her, but I don't want you to preach. Oh, no, no, she no, wasn't a teacher. She was, a, teacher? She was a student of mine. A student, yeah. okay, yeah, but I, I said, want you to preach. Yeah, I said, I want to hear any religion in my classroom. Um, that's, that was waving the red flag in front of uh, Sister Dolores not stifling her. She had no intention of preaching mm -hmm. in the classroom. It was um, my hostility right. to her and her faith, which was quite conspicuous since she was wearing a full habit with a you know, sure. crucifix on it and everything. You could stop her from preaching but not praying. Thank yeah. God for that, right? Yeah. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Howard, thanks for being with us. We really appreciate this. Thanks for having me. Are we the only ones here? Is this the only planet with life on it? Well, they told me that the universe was full of life, 
and that not only is there this physical universe, but there's um, other dimensions with other universes, and that God's sense of creating goes on and on and on, and it's just like lives and worlds and intelligent. Higher intelligent beings than us. Yeah, and that we are um, not way up on the pecking order of intelligent beings. But this is a, this is a tough world uh -huh. we're in. This is a world where um, there's a lot of uh, temptation, a lot of struggle, and a lot of uh, opposition to God. What would you say to people who would say, well, where does it say in the Bible there are other people out there? There are other Do worlds out doesn't. there. It doesn't. And they might argue then that part of your story is incorrect then. Because a lot of people believe that if it's not in the Bible, then it isn't. Right. Um, you know, early on people thought like in their city they were the only people on this earth and everybody else was like not even a human being. Mm -hmm. And then we got the idea that like um, our race was the only race and everybody else was somehow subhuman. And now we've realized that the earth does in fact orbit around the sun. And there's, <laughs> I was just reading um, this morning, matter of fact, about uh, they've discovered over 50 new planets already. This whole discovering planets in the universe is um, ha happening hot and fast right now. In time, people will realize that in this vast universe of trillions upon trillions of galaxies, each with full of solar systems, that God's creative ability is just vast. You know, when you think about God, um, look at like, God didn't make like a maple tree. He made all different kinds of maple trees, and every maple tree is unique. You know, mm -hmm. God didn't just make a kitty. Look at kitty cats. I mean, every cat is unique and wonderful, and, and, and um, God's creative nature and God's um, expression of God's love of the world is just without limit. Uh, but you wrote in your book, and um, maybe you can um, explain this a little better for me than maybe ha how I understood it. It's, some people would read one of your passages that talked about the fact that if, if, if you didn't do things as you should have done here on this earth, and when you died, that um, maybe there was more that you had to do to, to better yourself and that you might come back in some form or another. And they would look at it as reincarnation. Is that what you were talking no, about? No, what I was trying to suggest is that um, I've met a lot of people who um, have lost children and things like that. And they feel that somehow um, the people that have been lost have been shortchanged of a life experience. Mm -hmm. And all I was trying to suggest there was that God gives everybody ample life experience, mm -hmm. whether we're aware of, of it or not. To, do you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So that we don't have to worry about people being um, robbed of an opportunity to live, because they will live somewhere, somehow, some way. And I don't know how, where, or way, but God does. Mm -hmm. You know, because this life that we're in is about spiritual formation. That's the whole point. We're here to be um, matured as spiritual beings. We're not physical beings dreaming about being spiritual. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience to learn um, compassion and love in a world with very, very finite, limited possibilities. Um, and God will make sure that everybody has that opportunity. No one's going to, um, we can't stop it. Let's talk about though the issue of the Jewish people. Um, you saw a vision of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Talk about that because even though s people can't go to the Father unless they go through the Son, the Jewish people by and large have not accepted Jesus Christ as, as their Messiah. They're still waiting for Him to come. But you saw something very different in your view of the Holocaust, did you not? Yes. Um, I've always been disturbed by the Holocaust. I mean, I think every, every right-feeling person in the world would be disturbed. Mm -hmm. What was that all about? Why did God allow that to happen if they were God's chosen people? And we went to... See, I don't, I don't know how it works, but we were in an extermination camp. Mm -hmm. And the guards were uh, kicking people and shouting at people, and there were dogs, and people were being selected, and there was a crematorium off in the distance. And I could understand, I, I don't speak German, but in the experience I could understand German, and the guards were saying in German, which I could understand, um, more for the angel makers, more for the angel makers. And Jesus, who had his arm around me, said, look up in the sky. 
And what I saw was from the smoke of the crematorium, the people going up to heaven and the angels from heaven coming down and, and escorting them to heaven. And even more so was this, that these people who had just gone through um, hell, you know, through the, the horror of that camp and died, were now filled with ecstasy and joy. You saw I, that on their faces as they were uh -huh. rising into heaven. And so I, um, my understanding of the Bible is, is that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. My, the Lord and Savior of my life was a Jewish carpenter. Um, I don't knock Jews. You know, there's one big difference between the Jewish faith and ours. Is we both believe in the Messiah. We believe in the same God. We believe in the same ethics, really. The big difference is, is that they think the Messiah is yet to come. We say the Messiah has come and will come again. Um, I think it's, you know, not something to uh, really fight about. I, I think we should treat Judaism with a great deal of respect. Does that, but it doesn't also discount maybe each and every one of those individuals had a personal experience at the moment of death similar to yours where Jesus came right. to them and gave right. them a choice. We don't know yeah. whether that, not so that happened. I would, like to, I would suggest that every Jew who dies is going to meet the Messiah. You know, um, everybody who dies will meet the Messiah, will meet the Christ. And have an opportunity to accept or reject. Right, because it's all about what's in your heart. Now, I'm not talking, of course, about the organ that pumps blood. I'm talking about um, the core of your being, which is what you really are. Um, so a person could be a condemned murderer who's been um, executed for his crimes. But he could have reconciled himself with Christ, with God, received God's forgiveness, and go to God because God knows that in his heart there was goodness, even though he had done terrible, terrible things. Conversely, a person may think that they're just the most righteous, mm -hmm. quote, religious person in the world. But if they've been ultimately cruel and created dissension and discouragement, I mean, every church has someone like that that just mm -hmm. goes around creating trouble. It's like, you know, are you deliberately trying to destroy this church? You know, I mean, you know, and they're always the most self-righteous one, too. You know, these are always the people that are like, you know, sure. pretend to be the most holy. They aren't going. They're going the other way because that's who they really are. The interesting thing about um, Jesus, there's no deception. There's no shadow. He knows us fully, exactly, perfectly, and you cannot lie in his presence, you can't hide. It's all out in the open. Mm -hmm. What's and here? So it's not just about denying the existence of God. You're, you may verbally deny the existence of God, as you did, but when you're doing things that oppose God's will, when you're saying you love God, but yet you're doing the opposite. That's worse than, than denying God. You know, I, I, um, people who deny God's existence, having been one for um, a good part of my adult life, are people that are really angry at God. They're really disappointed. You know, so they're, in a sense, they're still ha in a relationship with God. They say, do you ever see a little kid go up to their parent and go, I hate you, I hate you, mommy, I hate you, you know, you're not my mommy anymore? <laughs> That's what people who claim to be atheists yeah. are. Um, I hope that I don't upset anyone, but um, I submit to you that in their heart, they know there's a God. And in their heart, they want more than anything else in the whole universe is to know the love of God and to be accepted by God. That's what they want deep down inside of them, but they're mad, and so they're going around knocking over the furniture and jumping on the sofa and breaking the dishes, you know, saying, you know, because they've been traumatized. Sister Dolores, once again, <laughs> she told me, she said, I said, why are the people like that? And she said, uh, there's a trauma. Look for the trauma. Um, and but your word to them would be... Um, you know, I, I've got some AA groups down in the basement of my church, and uh, they've taught me a lot about seeking God. And pr you know, the, the leader of the AA group, Jim, tells me all the time, he says, you can't help anyone until they've hit the gutter. Now, it doesn't mean that literally. You don't have to be down in the gutter, but you've, you've got to hit that low before you say, God, I am helpless with my problems. I need you. I can't do it. I need you to do it for me. When you hit that point, that's the beginning of the love affair. And that's what AA teaches in terms of alcohol. But I think it's true with um, all faith awakening.
you got to hit that low before you can grow. Can I tell you something? Sure. Um, a man called me up from Texas, and his mother was having a major heart surgery at one of the famous hospitals, mm -hmm. by one of the famous mm -hmm. doctors down in Texas. And he said, uh, someone told me about you, and I need you to come down here and help me through this, and I'll play your, pay your airfare. And he was basically promised me um, a day in and a day out. I said, I really don't have the time. He said, well, just come for one day, come in the morning, leave in the evening. I said, okay, so I go down there. There's a gangster. And this guy was like a really bad boy. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to hear about God and Jesus. His mother was a woman of faith. And here he was with his mother who was dying and he couldn't cope with it and stuff like that. So I testified to him and I loved him. And, um, you know, whenever he'd sort of tell me about his life, I'd like, oh, let's, let's go back to something else now. You know, I don't really need to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, a few weeks later, he called me up and he said his mother had died and he was with her when she died. He said, you know the, the light of Jesus that you talked about? He said, she opened up her eyes, and I could see reflected in her eyes the light of Jesus coming for her. And he said, you know what you told me? He said, it's true. It's real. I saw it. So I, I mean, I don't know whatever happened to him. But I'm sure that that had to have impacted him a little Saved bit. Saved a soul. Yeah, I which hope. Which is the yeah. ultimate thing you can do in this world, huh? Yeah. So, you know, you just you take your chances, and I've... Um, don't worry about the consequences of telling the truth because the world spends so much time, and particularly our society spends so much time, planting the seeds of doubt and deception and falsehood. Mm -hmm. That if we go around and make a little bit of truth statement every once in a while, um, it's quite necessary to counteract all the deceit that's in this world. Sure. And a big part of the deceit comes when people argue, okay, if there's this wonderful God, this, this one, this being up there who's all good and all knowing, why does he let so many bad things happen in this world? The Holocaust, for example, uh, World War II, I, World I War I. Asked that, I asked that exact question, and the response that they gave me was immediate and harsh. God hates those bad things. God never wanted those bad things to happen, and we are responsible for them. And they also told me that one of the things that um, God is very irritated about us, the human race, is that when anything's ever good, like we discover a vaccine for polio, you know, we did it, rather than realizing that it was God's inspiration mm -hmm. that helped us discover that. When anything bad happens, like a child is run over by a truck, or you have the Holocaust, or um, World War I. What was that about? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, we go, why did God do that? Or why we, didn't he stop it? Yeah, we blame God for the evil that we do and give God no credit for all the good that God does. It's, um, it's really perverse what we do. We should, God only does good. God never does evil, but he will allow us to experience the consequences of our actions. Mm -hmm. um, as any good parent, you know, one of the ways they tried to explain it to me but, was But like, what about innocent children, though? They, they talk about the poor, starving, innocent children, or children who are badly abused and brutalized and murdered. Who could stop that? Because these innocent children had no choice in this. God doesn't. He is trying to stop it. He is asking us to stop it. Every way, every day, he's telling us, don't do that. We know better, and, and we should care about those things. I mean, God is intervening. Will God take over this world and run it for us? No, because it would be um, a complete um, undermining of the, one of the most important gifts that God has given us. God has given us the ability to make a choice. Uh, people call it free will. You know, I, I've shown you the ways of good and evil, of right and wrong. Now, do something about it. God's very disappointed with what we're doing. Uh, God hates those things more than we do. You talked about the Cold War with him, and at mm -hmm. the time it was 1985, and yeah. he said that the collapse of communism would come and things would end, and you said, no, that can't happen. That's not going to happen. Well, it seems so absurd in 1985, and I told him that the Cold War was going to go on for hundreds of years, and he said, no, it's going to end um, bloodlessly in a few years. I was just, um, I, I actually told him they were wrong. It couldn't happen. Um, God is working in the world, but the way that God works is not doing big zaps with thunderbolts and lightning and stuff like that. God works by ch changing people's hearts. Mm -hmm. And God wants um, all of us. 
to be working towards the same end. And sending leaders out there. I know when the Berlin Wall fell and communism fell in different places across um, Russia and, and East Berlin, the Pope was given a great deal of credit because of his message of peace and love of God. Right. What did, how did you feel when that happened? You had been told this in 1985, and here it happens. It became. I, 89. I was just like, yeah. Um, well, here's, here's the bad part, because they told me some um, terrible things about this country. And I'm, I'm really concerned. Not for myself, because I'm 54 years old, and so I'm like, hey, whenever heaven's ready for me, I'm ready to go. So. Mm -hmm. What did they tell um, you? There's going to be another war? That or? this country has been given an assignment mm -hmm. to be a light to the nations. We are to be a moral leader to the world. Um, because we have been given so much. We're so yeah, strong. This, this country has been blessed more than any other people in the history of the world. Way more. We are the most powerful, richest people. All of this came from God. This is all a blessing from God. Our Heavenly Father gave us these gifts, and instead of being the moral leader of the world, we are the moral number one manufacturers and distributors of war materials and pornography and a violent lifestyle. And I know people in America always hate to hear that, but if you go to any country in the world, and I know you've been around the world, um, their idea of what America represents, you know, is shocking. Mm -hmm. Because what we export, our, the culture that we export, is so, it's demeaning to women, it's demeaning to human beings, it's demeaning to God, it's awful. And that's our number one product in this society. Um, not what God intended, and God will take the blessing away. And we're going to be in one sorry shape. What's God going does. to happen? Did you see what would happen? What could happen. Mm -hmm. what because could. what God wants is conversion of the heart. And so this wasn't like, this is going to happen. He said, without the conversion, this is what could happen. Mm -hmm. And that um, this society will just very rapidly uh, fall back into... Um, a barbarism that's just inconceivable. People literally shooting other people over a can of condensed milk and a, you know, So can social of gas chaos works. would erupt. Yeah, yeah. Um, because of the, uh, our economic structure is all very complex and very fragile. You know, it just begin to fall apart and people in our society are so um, self centered and greedy that they'll just start taking what they want, you know, and so we will destroy ourselves from within. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people are assuming that there's going to be a third world war out no. there, a nuclear war. No, um, I'm sorry. They told me, I asked about that, and they said, absolutely, there is not going to be a third world war. I was a product of um, post-war baby boom, so I've always mm -hmm. been very concerned about um, hydrogen bombs and atomic bombs. When I was a kid, we learned to um, duck and tuck mm -hmm. when I was at school, <laughs> which was really <laughs> pretty funny. Um, but I asked them, I said, is there going to be another nuclear war? And they said, no, God's not going to allow that to happen. God will not allow another nuclear war. Why? Did they tell you because why? God, yeah, because God loves this creation, the people, the birds, the rivers, the trees. And um, he's just not going to let us incinerate huge portions of it for our own silly gratification. So there's the possibility of this social chaos erupting and just destroying ourselves. And then what will happen? that out of that um, God plans through God's inspiration to raise people up who will live in harmony and love and gentleness with one another and with the creation. Describe that because I was reading that to somebody and they said this sounds like something out of a sci-fi novel. Yeah. It's something they had never even heard of, never even conceived in their own minds. Well, the, what they told me, I had never heard of or considered. If you had asked me before my experience what would the future look like, I would have said Star Wars. Mm -hmm. um, high tech. You know, doors that go <laughs> when you approach them, right? You don't right. have to touch them, they go <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you could talk to the computer and the computer would talk back to you. That's what I thought the future was going to be. Because that's where we're heading, we think. Yeah. Yeah. And what they were saying was a, a world of incredible simplicity, um, living in great harmony with nature, even to the point of um, us living in harmony in control of the weather and all the elements. How? How so? Um, God created us to be stewards of this planet, caretakers of this planet. And we've done a poor job. And they told me that we have a lot of capacities that have never been released our, rela our relationship with the 
animal kingdom, vegetable kingdom, and with the whole planet. Um, in time, as we become spiritually more sophisticated and wiser, we'll live in harmony with those systems rather than seeing them as our enemy. Remember when you were a kid, did you have to read Moby Dick? Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was nature was something to be dominated and killed because nature was like ultimately hostile to us. Completely wrong. We need to be going the other way with nature and learning to live more in, in harmony with it. Um, and it will live in harmony with us. And so you have, uh, you describe it as um, people living very modestly. Yeah. Um, and basically they only had enough food to survive and only enough material but possessions. But they could grow food at will. Uh huh. So they didn't need, I mean, they had no anxiety. You know, you know, I never thought of this before, just to hear me. They lived the way Jesus and his disciples lived. Right. You know, and that kind of stuff. spoke telepathically. Um, all over the whole world and the whole universe. They could talk to people, intelligent beings, all over the whole universe. And when people didn't fear death because they knew that death was just a transition to moving on to a higher state. People lived, first, first of all, they lived to love and nurture and raise the children. Everybody's number one priority was the raising of children. And they made it, Jesus and the angels made it really clear to me that that's what we should be doing. We should make children our number one priority. Secondly, they lived to love and support one another in their intellectual pursuits, their artistic pursuits, their um, musical pursuits, whatever it is people were interested in. People lived to support one another in that. and. Uh, People lived in harmony. They said when somebody got out of harmony with the rest of the community, the whole harmony, the, uh, the, excuse me, the whole community cared about that and was involved with trying to bring that person back And when they got in. sick, they would pray them back to health. Mm -hmm. There was some, um, they eliminated sickness because when someone got sick, they would just heal them. Now this was in 1985, and you said that they said this would occur in 200 years. Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty preposterous, but um, who am I to argue with God, you know? I mean, I told him, I said, it's ridiculous. I did. I, well, after you're around Jesus for a while, you, you know one of the things you realize? You can say anything you want to. I mean, you don't say ugly things. Mm -hmm. But you say what's in your heart. Sure. And that's what he wants to hear from us. He doesn't want hypocrisy. He doesn't want formality. He doesn't want nonsense. He wants from your heart, from the core of your being. What do you really think? What do you really feel? Um, he understands. He's been around. You know, there's nothing we can do to surprise Jesus. So what happens after that then? Um, How long does that, that life I last? don't know. I don't know. It's, that's not the second coming. That's just a better world, making the world more the kind of place that God created to be. Um, and I didn't inquire sort beyond that. Sort of a that. heaven on earth? Well, compared to the world the way it is today, it would be paradise. But right. it's not because people would be born and raised and have accidents and die. Um, I mean, it's not eternity on earth. It would still be earth and the same laws of physics would mm -hmm. apply. We would just live in a much more um, sophisticated relationship with our environment. Mm -hmm. Which means because our relationship with the environment was so much more sophisticated, it's actually much simpler. Right. Yeah. Now you said um, the, the bad things that could happen, for example, to the United States could happen. Mm -hmm. But through prayer, through conversion, that could end. And God has sent us guardian angels or angels. Right. Millions to of them. Millions, millions to help us. Let's talk about that. First of all, what do they look like? Well, I've seen the guardian angels in many forms, and they can take different forms because, um, well, first of all, they can appear to be just like a regular person, and you don't know it. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had the experience, and I've met many people that had the experience of meeting someone, and they're like, wait a minute, that was impossible. That was an angel. That couldn't, you know, I mean, that it defied the laws of physics. They were here, and then they were, you know what I mean? Right, uh, right. So angels can appear to be like people, but they also... I've seen angels in their full-blown glory, and the room is so bright, it's like you had a million candle watts of electric power going on, and they're radiant and beautiful and And you've painted that, and, and, but you can't Yeah, it's a failure. I mean, I'm like such a... Um, but they so don't have angel wings like the little cherubs well, we look no, at. Well, the, no, the, the wings actually, you know, it, it actually come from, in the Bible, it talks about uh, that they, they radiate, mm -hmm. and that has come to be translated as wings, but it's actually that they are um, radiant appendages, and that's what they do. They, angels give light. They are radiant beings, as opposed to you and I who are opaque beings and absorb light. They, they give off light, but it's spiritual light. Mm -hmm. 
and they're, they're beautiful. And they're meant for us for what reason? For what purpose? Well, first of all, they love us. They're emissaries from God, but they are very concerned about how much they um, would intervene in our lives. And they're in constant communication with God about how much or how little they can intervene because it's the nature of an angel that they want to intervene all the time. But they know that that's not good for us because if the angels gave us everything we always wanted, we would be a bunch of spoiled brats and it would be absolutely no good at all. Um, so they love us, they're with us, they take our concerns to God, they help us in subtle ways. Protect like who, us. Yeah, who hasn't had an example of um, you lose something and you finally, after looking for it and looking for it, you say, oh, God, send an angel and t just help me find the, my checkbook. And all of a sudden, boom, right? There it was all along mm -hmm. on the top of the desk. And you go like, how did I miss it? I mean, they do help us sometimes in, in lots of ways. But one of the ways that they help us is they're constantly trying to point us in the right direction, which is of love and compassion. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but you said also in your book, you, I would like you to clarify this, you talked about how um, maybe even if we die, we can sort of become guardian angels for loved ones who are still back uh -huh. here. You don't mean transforming into an angel. It's sort of just, you used it as They said that some, some people that have like a real attachment will be, can be around the people that they've left behind because for a while. Because we've always been taught that a human being cannot become an angel. Yeah, but we um, ultimately will be even greater than the angels. Right. But what you mean is a protector no, like I mean, an angel? When, when you talk about an, I mean, this angel means several things. So it can be any messenger of God. Mm -hmm. So I could be like an angel. I could say, I'm being an angel to you. Sure. You're an angel to me. But um, really, it's a class of beings who is created perfect and good and always does the perfect will of God. You know, they've never lived in this world. They've never, you know, gone through the struggle of making these choices between good and evil that we mm -hmm. go through. There have been many reported apparitions, visions of the Blessed Mother, um, of Jesus, of yep. other saints, all across the world throughout history. Right. And some have been approved, for example, some have been approved by the Catholic Church if they've been to Catholic kids or, or yeah. adults, and some have not. And a lot of people believe them and a lot of people don't believe them. What is your feeling about those well, instances? I mean, right now there's been a lot of things going Ever since Medjugorje there's been mm -hmm. like a whole resurgence of visionaries in the United right. States and um, even in Cincinnati we have a whole big thing going on of visionaries right. and stuff like that. Uh, um, I think it's good to try and um, use some spiritual discernment and a simple test would be uh, is it consistent with the scripture or are you hearing weird stuff? Like I heard of a visionary in Long Island I believe it was that mm -hmm. said that Jesus wasn't the Christ and stuff like that. Well that doesn't pass the smell test. You can like, you know, walk away from that one. I mean, you know, when the minute a visionary says they don't like Jesus, you know, it's like, you know, they're out of it. Um, another thing is, what, what are they advocating? Like in Medjugorje, what I understand is that uh, the vision is advocating conversion and prayer. So would that be of God or of the devil? Let me see, you know? Right. Um, so you look at, is it consistent with the Bible and what the Bible teaches? And is it um, doing, advocating good or is it advocating harm? Mm -hmm. And that would be a, a good testament. But you wrote in your book that God has sent throughout the ages emissaries of different yeah. sorts. It could be the Blessed Mother, it could be anybody, to help bring us back to Jesus, to God. Yep. Um, many of them, and even us, have been touched by them and didn't even know it. Like, how many of us, the faith that we have, we caught from like a grandmother, for mm -hmm. example, or an aunt, or a Sunday school teacher? So you know what I mean? In a sense, God has inspired those people to be that special emissary to us. But God is working. I asked, why doesn't God do something really big and convince everybody and put it to rest? <laughs> you know, and I, my idea was like sort of turn the sky orange and then like in flaming letters, believe in God or else or something like that. You know, and, I mean, who could dispute it? You right. know? And they said, uh, that's coercion. God doesn't do coercion. It's got to be free choice. Because that's the tremendous gift he gave us. Yeah. That's why he loved us so much. Yeah. And that's what we're here to learn about. How do you exercise that choice? You know, um, and every minute of the day is an opportunity to make those choices. But obviously, and, and, and people would argue, everything you need to know is within that Bible. 
as he said, everything to convert is in the Bible, but he gave you this experience. You're back. You're talking to people about it, which will probably save who knows how many souls out there through your well, books. Well, I hope one at least. And through yeah. maybe this program. Yeah. There have been other people with similar experiences to you. So just because it's not in the Bible doesn't mean God can't reach out and say, look, wake up. You're going down that yeah, slippery God, slope. God is moving in powerful ways. They, they told me that this was a time of great spiritual awakening because God does not want to punish us or condemn us. God wants conversion to be the people of God that God created us to be. So God is moving in powerful ways. Um, Near-death experiences is just one tiny little way that God is working, but there's all kinds of like um, things going on in terms of charismatic renewals sure. in the churches and things like that. It's just endless. The way that God is stirring, stirring things up. But what's the reception to these things? Is, mm -hmm. it, um, are, is it just the uh, preaching to the choir or are people actually being converted? That's the real issue. Now, you were able to ask him countless questions, and of course, everybody's yeah. going to read about it when they get your book, My Descent into Death by Howard Storm. You finish talking with Jesus and, and with the angels, and, and then they tell you what? It's time to go back? Oh, it was um, very disappointing because they said that I had to come back to this world. I said I wanted to go to heaven. They said, no, you've got to come back to this world and live this stuff. And um, I said, I don't want to come back to this world. And we had a huge argument because I said the world's full of cruelty and ugliness and awful people and evil, and why would you send me back to a world like that? And they said, well, you know, those things are there, but there's also goodness and loving people and kindness and beauty in the world, and whatever it is we seek, we will find. So if we seek beauty, we'll find beauty. If we seek loving people, that's the nice thing about um, going on the Christian walk. There's all the neat people you meet, you know? Mm -hmm. right. But uh, anyhow, we had this huge argument, and we talked about forgiveness and prayer and all these things, and ultimately, um, I thought I had something that would allow me to go to heaven. I said, you can't send me back to the world because I will die of a broken heart if you do. Because now that I have known you in your love, speaking of Jesus and the angels, I could not bear to ever be away from you again. I absolutely meant this, and they knew I meant it. And they said, haven't you been paying attention? We've always been with you. We always will be with you. And I said, but I never saw you before. I never heard you. I never felt you. I mean, when I go back, it's going to be like that again, right? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, pretty soon it'll be like you don't exist. And I won't know you. And I said, but there is a way to know us. And I said, how? And I said, that if I prayed, if I confessed my sins, which I like to think of as coming clean with God, mm -hmm. you know, just laying your cards out on the table, you know, um, and prayed to God and left time to listen and feel God, which is like, be quiet, be still, you know, wait on the Lord. They said, sometimes you would know we're with you. And they've kept that promise. And so sometimes I feel their presence. So I've had some experiences too, but... So you said, okay, then I think I can go back? Yeah. And then... And with that, I was back. And to my <laughs> horror, I was right back in that body that had been in such terrible shape. Lying on a hospital bed. Yeah, what happened? And, um, immediately upon me coming back, the nurse who had been in the room a uh, little while earlier and said there was no doctor, came back into the room and said, a doctor has arrived at the hospital, we're going to do the surgery right away. And they evicted my wife from the room, and they prepped me and did the surgery that I needed. So you, they performed the surgery on you, and you're, you're back in recovery, and you wake up. How do you deal with all this when, when you're back? Well, it's a huge dilemma, because I knew that what I had experienced was fantastic, to say the least. I mean, incredible, meaning who would believe me? incredible. And when I tried to tell my wife and other people, it was incredible. They didn't believe me. They thought um, it was a delusion or hallucination or something like that. And um, for a while, it, that caused me to sort of withdraw from wanting to deal with people because it was, and I and I'd pray to God, like, if, um, if you gave me this experience and nobody wants it, mm -hmm. then why did you give it to me? And why did you, you give me the memory of it? 
Because I think a lot of people have these experiences, but they don't remember. I know several people that have had experiences, but they say, I can't quite remember it. Yeah. But yeah. I have a vivid memory in my Vivid detail. Yeah. But you're, you're laying in there, and you, and, you, and you have this feeling or this, hear this voice that says, get some airline tickets, you're going home over the weekend or, or Monday, whenever it was, yeah. in a few days. And you didn't imagine that could be possible because uh, you were really, you had just had a major yeah, operation. Yeah, was, that was on Tuesday, and I'd had the surgery on um, Saturday night. But your wife comes in, you tell her to go get the tickets, and... Yeah, she goes, uh, I mean, this is all so bizarre, people won't believe it, but it's the truth, absolutely. Um, she walks out in the hall, goes to the play phone, calls, collect her mommy and daddy in Iowa City, Iowa, and says, we're in trouble, I need a couple thousand dollars, we've got to come home. They said, give us your phone number, we'll call you right back. They call their bank, their banker, and uh, he said... What a coincidence. I just came back from Paris and we had an emergency and I had to wire money over there and I know how to do it. Tell it will be at such and such an address in 10 minutes. Uh, you know, if you ever try to get w money in a foreign country, you know it's like sure. weeks. I right, mean, it's impossible. Right, right. But this banker knew how to do it like now. My wife comes back into the room. She says, I've talked to my parents. Um, they're sending the money. I'll be back in an hour. She leaves, comes back in about an hour with two TWA airline tickets to go back to the United States on Monday morning, which is what I told her to do. And I said, what in the world have you done? She said, you told me to get the tickets. And I said, yeah, but why did you do it? That's crazy. I'm sick. I'm going to be here for a month. You know, I can't go home. And, um, but I did get well enough to come back to the United States because I needed the attention of an American mm -hmm. hospital. But you had a guardian angel visit you in the hospital before you left. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, several different ones. Um, but the one was like, came in, in the form of a young doctor. Mm -hmm. That was the one that I was most, most fond of. He um, was in his early 20s, blonde, short, uh, short hair, um, wearing uh, white short sleeve, um, scrub, white pants, white shoes, and white belt. And he, we had a long conversation, but basically he told me that he was going to watch over me, but I might never see him again, which I thought was pretty weird. Like, and he walked into the room. It lit up. It was yeah, bright. Yeah. And when he left, it, the room it, went back to dark again. And when the nurse came into the room, I said, who was that doctor that was just here? And she says, there's not been anybody here. I said, you don't understand. There was a young man. I described him to her perfectly. And she said, well, my desk is outside your door. No one has been in your room. I was like, all right, who was that then? You know, where did he come from? But I always felt that God gave me his presence to help me because it's um, scary being really sick and trying to recuperate in a foreign country and stuff like that. And that did. That did the trick. That gave me the confidence that I was going to be okay. And you got back home, and they told you you should have been dead within five hours. And it was... Yeah. And when I got back, when I came to the United States, they, I had uh, extreme peritonitis, double pneumonia, collapsed lungs, and... Um, no liver function. And I was put on the critical list at um, St. Luke's Hospital in Fort Thomas. And I was on critical for five weeks. Mm -hmm. I was really sick, but I didn't... Um, and you thought you were going to die, though, didn't you? Yeah, and, I, and, and I'm ashamed of this, but I wanted to die because um, I just wanted to go to heaven. I just wanted to be with Jesus. And I didn't have anything else in my mind except I wanted to go back to mm -hmm. that. And if you knew him, you would have just you'd understand, you know, why I, that's what I wanted to go back to. So I wasn't cooperating in my healing. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't eat. I couldn't take anything. Uh, I was getting weaker and weaker and sicker and sicker. And I'm, I got to tell you the story. Um, a night nurse by the name of Lisa came in one night, and she, she was about the only person in the hospital who had been listening to me talk about Jesus and his love and all this stuff. And this sweet little Lisa, real recent graduate of a... a AA program in nursing, got an associate's degree. She said, I'm going to make you a milkshake. I'm going to go down to oncology and make you a milkshake and get you well. And I said, I, I, said, I haven't eaten anything in weeks. You know, like, forget it. I'm not eating a milkshake. The, the idea makes me sick. And she said, we'll see. And she came back and she said, I put raw eggs in this. And I put protein supplement in it. And I made it with, like, the best ice cream in Cincinnati and like, real cream and stuff like this. This huge milkshake. I said, Lisa, just the smell of it makes me nauseous. Get it out of my room. And she said, listen, I made this out of love, and you're going to get well now. 
And she stood there for over an hour while I sipped on that stupid thing and drank the whole thing. Now, she probably could have gotten fired from the hospital for doing this. But, I mean, she was absolutely inspired by God to do this because there's no reason in the world why she would have done that for mm -hmm. me, you know. And, and from that day on, I just started getting better. And while you were laying in that hospital room, you also um, kept hearing somebody, a patient in another room wailing. Oh, yeah. That was a beautiful experience as well. So, so sad. A man across the hall whose name was Clarence uh -huh. had extreme Alzheimer's. And all he did was make um, sounds like a... Uh, wild animal, really loud though. Mm -hmm. He was also a biter. And every time a nurse, I'd see, I'd see a nurse or something go into his room. A few minutes later, ah, you know, like, Clarence, don't bite me. You know, um, he, he couldn't make any um, rational sounds. And his wife stayed in the room with him. And she was a sweet woman. I felt so sorry for her and for Clarence. And one night, he was driving me crazy. He, he would wake me up in the middle of the night with his howling and his screaming, and nobody could calm him down. You know, it was like a wild animal. And, uh, and it's like, man, I'm sick. I'm trying to get well. And this guy's like making me sicker, you know, with his noise. And so I said, I said to God, I said, what, what is this about? Why, why do I have to be, you know, in a hospital with this, like, crazy man, you know? And I was shown that what he was doing, Clarence was still Clarence, way deep down inside that diseased body. And he was just, Clarence was basically yelling, I'm still alive, I'm still here, I'm still me. But he wasn't able to express it. Uh-uh. So it's just coming out in all these strange, contorted ways. And then what did you do? I started to pray for him, you know? And I thought that uh, he and I became buddies after that, although I never saw him. Didn't you yell out something, or Clarence, I, I, yeah. I know you're there, yeah. and it calmed him when he did that? Mm -hmm. I, yelled, I yelled to him, and I said, Clarence, I'm hearing you now. I finally understand what you're saying. And that calmed him. Yep. Somebody heard him. Yep. His cries Nobody heard else him. heard him. Well, you couldn't hear him, because it just, was just yeah. noise. Now, yeah. eventually you're released from that hospital. And I have to also point out, there was no evidence on paper that you received that said you actually had died in that right. Paris hospital. Right. Because did you ever ask for it, or they they didn't know? Oh yeah, we um, we had the American consulate, we had a U.S. senator, we had all kinds of people try and get my medical records, and they would never send my medical records. Oh, so you've never even gotten the records? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I think I know why. <laughs> because of what they didn't. Do. Yeah, you're right. The lawsuits. You get out of the hospital, and eventually you recuperate, and you're back at the university. Mm-hmm. And how how do you deal with that? You're back in this environment where you were in before, a very heady intellectual environment yeah. with your friends around, all non-believers, I assume. Well, I wanted to show them Christian love, and um, they asked me to be the department chair. Uh, and so I became an administrator. And I did my best to take care of their needs and to love them and to get them the best raises I could possibly get and get them the equipment and the facilities and the materials that they were all hollering for. for. But um, they were not interested in my message. And in fact, um, some of the administrators over me told me to never, ever mention my experience or God or heaven or Jesus or anything, ever, ever. They thought ever. you were loony. They thought you were making it up? Um, they despised it. They hated it. It made them angry. Yeah, I mean, I had people say to me, sidle up to me and says, you know, you don't really believe all that crap you've been saying. You know, you don't believe that, do you? You know, like, oh, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, people, they don't want to accept it because if they were to accept it, then it would challenge the whole structure of their thinking, you know? So I felt um, more and more alienated from my colleagues, unfortunately, because it seemed, and, and I was also becoming more and more fascinated by the church, which, the university is supposed to be a haven of light, mm -hmm. but it was really the church that was the haven of light. And which church at this point? Well, I prayed when I was recuperating from my illness. I prayed a lot to God, where, where would I go? And ultimately, I was talking to an artist on the telephone. I was not ambulatory. And she said, well, I go to this church down the street, and I asked my wife, and it turned out it was what I had been raised in, and it was only a mile away. And so I went there, and uh, 
I saw it full of the angels and uh, full of uh, funky people trying to be better people, and I said, boy, this is for me. And you had a, a, a Catholic nun, a friend, a student, who had, had prayed you into this. You never considered Catholicism. You went back to something that you were familiar with, or you felt called back to? I did to. consider Catholicism. I went on, um, actually, I went on several retreats with the Jesuits, and they said, um, basically to me, you're doing fine where you are, why don't you just stay where you are? Mm -hmm. I, did look, I did look at Catholicism and consulted priests, and they, they didn't discourage me. They said, but... Follow where God's taking you? Yeah, you're, um, you're being very active in the church that you're in, doing the right thing. Why, why would you uh, leave that and come do this? And I couldn't really explain that. I didn't, I didn't feel called to do that. So over the next seven years, by seven years later, you're, you're a Protestant minister. You, you have a master's in divinity. And you decide to chuck all the university life and... Yeah, that was hard because I'd worked so hard to become a tenured professor. And finally, um, as a tenured professor and as a, a chair, was in the gravy. Sure. Um, it it takes a while, but, uh, you know, I was doing real well. You know, and your and wife's a, an attorney. How yeah. does she feel about that? Well, she thought I was absolutely out of my mind. Yeah. You know, she was saying... Look, if you want to be like a minister, you can go get a church and do it on the weekend and keep your job. You know, nobody's stopping you. You can, you can play minister if you want. And I said, no, I, I want my whole life to be about the church, about God's people. And she said, well, you can do mini you're doing ministry at the university. And I said, yeah, I know, but it's, I can't talk about Jesus. I can't talk about God. I mean, that's not what I had in mind. I want to give my life to the church. So I went to seminary for three years and um, became ordained, and I've been at this church for nine and a half years. Right. Yeah. Do you feel like now that if God would review your life these last nine and a half years, the last year since 1985 even, um, that you would be a disappointment to him no. again? No. Um, I don't want to sound presumptuous. I haven't done a perfect job. I've made a lot of mistakes. There's a few things I'd be embarrassed about. You're still making a few mistakes then. Yeah, yeah. I, I ain't no saint. <laughs> but um, I feel like, see, all it's God asks of us, I know this absolutely, God asks, just do our best. Not, God's not saying be perfect, change the world, you know, just do your best. And God knows that I've done that. And so all I need to hear from Jesus is, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. Not, you've been a success, not, wow, you know, you really had a big impact or anything. Well, I was faithful and I did my best. That's mm -hmm. all he wants from us. What would you tell any of the, the intellectuals that might be listening and are, are, are closing their hearts to this message or closing their minds to this message because they're not allowing their hearts to, to speak to them. How can they begin to grasp what you're saying? Because it's a very simple message well, and sometimes they, people want the bells and whistles and something just enormous to happen. Well, these you know, intellectual people, people tend to live in the rational mind and not the experiential mind, but I would say that if you pray to God the simplest possible prayer said God you know in the name of Jesus I would like to experience you in my life I would like to know you or know if you're real and if they gave that a chance in peace and quiet and sincerity that God would not disappoint them um, so I would challenge them if they consider themselves to be of any um, intellectual integrity or not try it and find out for yourself because the danger, the truth of the danger out there, and that's what you experience, I think that's what's so powerful, is that the devil and the evil spirits are out there prowling the earth, as, as we've yeah. read in the Bible. Like a roaring lion. Like a roaring lion. And, and people don't like to believe that, don't like to talk about it, dismiss it as something that's yeah. only in horror it's, movies. It's the, one of the greatest success of the evil one is to convince us all that it's not real, and it's all a big game. And unfortunately, it's too real, and it's something that needs to be taken seriously. I don't like to, um, I like to fill myself up with the light of Christ, and that takes care of my problem with evil. Mm -hmm. But you bump into it every once in a while, 
you know, and you got and you got to face the reality of it. Even after you've accepted Christ. Yeah. But for those who haven't accepted Him yet, they have to be aware that if they haven't accepted Him, then they're being led by another force. Absolutely, they don't even know how much He has power over them. You know. It doesn't matter what you've done. God is always willing to take you back. Is that not true? You're like the prodigal son. Right. It's the, in the, the incredible thing is, is people, well, I'm too bad. I've done too many wicked things or something like that. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I have a man that I'm working with who's on death row in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And he did a really bad thing. You don't want to know about it. It's really, it's the worst thing you can imagine he did. Venus Cron, yes. And he has turned to God and he's received God's forgiveness. And he lives in this horrible, constricted little life, death row, trying to be a witness to the other, um, there's 200 men on death row there, to the other men up there. And he has purpose and meaning in his life, although his life is really, really hard. And he'll never get out of there. And he admits his crime and he doesn't want to get out. He doesn't seek a pardon or anything. He just, he, he feels his punishment is justified. But the only way he'll ever get out of there is to die or be executed. But his name's Martin. Martin is right with God and he knows it. Anybody can be right with God. Was it your personal witness to, to Martin that helped him? Because we always are told that the, our it personal had a little, wit... It was a, a little people. We all have our own little role to play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of us, the Bible says, some of us till, some of us weed, some of us cultivate, some of us nurture. And we don't really need to claim the harvest. You know, just play our part. You know, do you, you, you know what I mean in terms of the conversion of the sure. world? And it begins with how you treat the person at the cash register. You treat them like a thing because they feel like a thing. You know, if you've ever done um, service work with people, you know what I mean? Everybody treats you like you're just, you know, furniture. You bring a little joy and brightness into their life. But it's not always easy, and sometimes maybe your family members won't accept your message readily. No, at, yeah, um, the odds are really good that they're going to be the first uh, problem you're going to face, and I have too. And w what we need to do with our family, uh, I learned this the hard way, the difficult way is you've got to pray and pray and pray for them and turn them over to God because you're the least effective person in terms of converting them. Mm -hmm. um, you need to pray for them and love them, but don't try and convert your family. Let God convert your family. Um, be the right example. Always be willing. Always, you know. But, I mean, I to told my kids, you know, if you don't go to church, you're not going to get any money. And, you know, that doesn't work. Threats, threats and fear don't make it. Only builds resentment. So ultimately, you would tell people out there that God has a very special plan for each and every one of them. But in o order to understand their plan, they need to pray for guidance from Him. To pray it and to explore it. The way that we find what God wants us to do is with trial and error. Um, God has given me certain um, gifts and abilities mm -hmm. and lots of limitations, lots of places where I'm not gifted and stuff. So I have to learn through trial and error where I should put my energy, put my compassion, put my concern, you know, and, and, other, and other things don't get involved with it because I'm not good at it or it's not fruitful for me. You know what I mean? So we explore, but the, the main thing is this is the school of learning how to love, and it's all experiential learning. But it's a it's not theoretical, it's experiential. But it's a universal message for all people. I know when we were speaking on the phone about yeah. the Jesus Christ issue, and you said something to me, you said you didn't feel like you needed to ask about that specifically because you understood that if people love God, they love Jesus, and they might not even know they love Jesus yeah. because God is Jesus. Yeah, there's no... Um, there are three revelations of God. God, the Creator, Father, Christ, the Son, who lived as a person called Jesus of Nazareth for, you know, 30-odd years, and the Holy Spirit. But it's um, three persona of the same being. Um, and there's, in essence, no difference between any of them. If you had to leave people with one thought, one message, something that, that they could hold on to, you've said so much already, obviously, but just something that, that you want th to leave them with. That 
it's, it's very easy for, um, that God loves you way more than you can possibly imagine. That's what I want people to know. How much, I, I, I can only say it, I can't, they have to find out for themselves, but they're very, very important to God, and God's love for them is just much greater than anything they could ever imagine. Howard Stone's unforgettable account of his near-death experience has taught us many precious lessons, and that death need never be feared by anyone. And it's important to remember that God predestines no one to go to hell. It is our choice. I'm Mary Lou McCall. Thanks for joining me.